Hey friends, welcome back to the Big Talk Podcast. I'm your host, Trisha Brooke, founder of the Big Talk Academy, award-winning director, producer, and author. And this is episode 542. This week, I am once again talking with the amazing Melanie Dietzel. She first joined us on the podcast in episode 137, and I am so honored to have her back. As a leading voice in content marketing, Melanie creates and teaches systems that help individuals and teams be more creative and more efficient. She is the author of two books, The Content Funnel Framework and Prove It. Melanie is also the co-founder and chief learning officer of The Creator Kitchen, a flexible online membership program that helps busy, ambitious, experienced creators grow creatively and improve their existing content creation practice and projects. She is frequently named as a top influencer, expert, and person to follow in marketing. And I am super excited for you to hear from her today. Melanie, welcome back to the Big Talk Podcast. I'm so excited to have you on for a second time as a featured guest. It's really good to be back. And so much has changed since the last time we chatted. <laughs> oh my gosh. I looked at the date. It was January 17th, 2018, episode 137. Oh my goodness. We're 500 episodes <laughs> in. Your life is completely different. Yeah, And I'm absolutely. so excited to dive in to what that looks like now. So let's take us back as far back as you want to go and what <laughs> has brought you here with us today. So I am a journalist turned marketer and my mission really broadly is to help people access their creativity. And for the most part, that work has come to fruition through content and content marketing, helping people come up with content ideas, helping people create better content, feel more confident in their content skills. And I've done that in a whole bunch of different ways, which I'm, I'm sure we'll get into, but uh, education and helping people access that creativity is really key for me. Amazing. When you were on the show in 2018, we were talking about being of service to the audience. And I've seen you speak many times and you're an extraordinary speaker, by the way. Let's just Thank start you. there. Thank you're welcome. You. And now being able to market yourself as a, a teacher of how to be a storyteller and create content for your own marketing, you do it in a way that is so clear and so doable. Thank you. It's a, You're welcome. <laughs> it's a it's really good to hear because that's a big part of sort of my ethos is I really feel like creativity is an accessible skill or it should be for everyone. And so it absolutely breaks my heart when I hear people say like, oh, I'm not creative or I'm not I'm not good at that. I'm not a good writer because all of these things are just skills and you may not have focused on them up to this point, but it is 100% something you can practice, learn and begin to leverage in your own work, whatever that is. So really focused on that. Yeah. Like I said, the education and just helping people feel like they can own that skill. Amazing. I would like for us to kind of break down what creativity means to you, what writing skills mean to you. And then I'm going to throw you a curveball, how you feel about AI right now in chat GPT. <laughs> All right. So, <laughs> so first question is what let's, is creativity? Yeah. Let's start about, start with that creativity. One of my favorite things. It's so interesting. There's lots of really broad definitions of this and you can get super technical if you're going into the research, but the way I like to think of it is the ability to use your mind to generate ideas for the things that are important to you. Because for some people that might mean you're painting, for some people it might be you're writing song lyrics, and for others it's creating marketing campaigns. So really that ability to tap into your inner power to generate those ideas that are most important for you, for your career, for your community. And I know how I tap into my inner power of creativity. I've been doing it my entire life as a dancer, theater, film, television, and now the work that I do with helping to amplify voices. How do you tap into your personal creativity and how do you teach your students, clients, community to do that? It's a really good question. Uh, personally, I know that I do my best work when I'm in nature. So I like to uh, take a break, walk, listen to the birds. And I have a lot of bird feeders in my backyard because I know that the, that's kind of the environment that works well for me. Um, and I also like to just be around the buzz of people. So sometimes if I'm feeling stuck, I'll go and work from a cafe and just that energy of productivity and movement kind of gets me, gets me a nice jolt to keep going. Uh, but I think it's different for everyone. I think the biggest thing that I find is a blocker to that is some version of psychological safety. 
So if you're finding that you're not feeling creative, you're not coming up with innovative ideas, or you're feeling stuck, blocked, whatever, it's probably that some part of you is scared of doing the wrong thing, taking a risk, being wrong, failing. And that's probably the bigger blocker than any sort of tip or trick or tool that you could use is really working on that inner stuff that's getting in the way of doing your best work. You're touching on something that I hear and see all the time inside of this community is the thought leaders, the influencers, the speakers, they say, uh, what I have to say doesn't matter. Somebody else has already said it. My trauma is not as bad as someone else's. Uh, Nobody cares about what I have to say. It is so painful to hear that. And so I love that you're saying the blockers are real. Oh yeah. And, And when we can eliminate those blockers, then we free ourselves up to start playing and Why is play and why is failure so important in the process of creativity? You know, it's really interesting doing this kind of work while I have a toddler. So she's three years old and I get to watch her absolute like unbridled creativity, her ideas, no hesitation, no fear of being ridiculed, no fear of being wrong. Uh, You know, we asked her recently what she wanted to be when she grew up and she said a fire truck, not a firefighter, a fire truck, because why not? Right. And so I think when we can play and really let go, we kind of tap into that inner child that that used to be like that, that used to suggest things, that used to give wild and crazy ideas, that wasn't worried about the judgment of society. And over time, we've just been conditioned to kind of keep that voice quiet that, you know, you don't want to get in trouble. You don't want to get made fun of. You don't want to get fired or reprimanded. And so we do the safe thing and the quiet thing. And we slowly train that part of our brain to quiet down. So that's where it's really important to play, to have fun, and to kind of light that section of your brain up again so you can tap into it. I love that. And I think that your daughter being a fire truck is amazing. <laughs> I have fire trucks are very yet. cool. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, definitely. <laughs> that's so cool. We do something when we're when we're um, sitting around a rehearsal room. I do this with my actors and we, I, I, I say today is all about everybody's worst idea. We're going to have a bad idea conversation. And it's so fun because then people start thinking, oh my gosh, I can say anything because it's already yes. qualified as being a bad idea. Yep. It's it. That's the psychological safety that I was talking about. Is that like permission to just speak without having to worry about whether an idea is fully formed or, or possible or reasonable. And I think a big part of it is there's two types of thinking that we associate with like creativity. The first is divergent thinking. That's the one you were just talking about, right? Like thinking off the wall, out of the box, you know, big, bold ideas, however you want to think of it. And then the second is the convergent thinking. That's where we sort of sculpt and mold and hone the idea into its finished form. And the biggest challenge is that we often try to do both at the same time. And that's where, here's my idea. Well, okay, but we don't have the budget for that. Or here's my idea. And then, oh, well, that's not really doable for us. And so you get into this ping pong that winds up kind of getting everyone to quiet down. They don't want to get shot down. So exactly what you mentioned, this sort of bad idea is that's the permission to just do the divergent thinking and we'll worry about what's reasonable and possible later. That's so great. And Lamott talks about writing the first worst draft. Yes. Love it. You have to just do it before you can even start to um, understand the, 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 the vastness of your creativity. I think for me, one of the things like the bad first draft element was giving myself permission to not write in order, which can sound chaotic. But what it means is if I'm sitting down trying to come up with the perfect first line, I'm keeping myself from the rest of what's coming. So I will write whatever part of that story, that talk, that you know article is coming to me in that moment. And then I will sew all those pieces together and fill in the gaps as needed. That is kind of what allows me to keep going and not have that moment of I need to have the perfect right line. We'll get to that later. I love that. How many movies have you seen, Melanie, where the person sits down in front of the computer and the cursor is blinking <laughs> and they sit there and nothing's coming and they write yeah. two words and then they delete it? That is something that we all experience, is, which is why it's always in movies. Yeah, absolutely. It's it's so funny. There's a lot of corollaries to all the things in life where we compare ourselves to someone else's like, you know, highlight reel. We compare ourselves to someone else's shortlist. We're thinking of all the finished, edited, polished work that we've seen and expecting it to come out just like that off the bat. And that's just not how it works. 
It is not how it works. I love that you're reminding us of that and giving us permission to write out of order. I think that is so powerful. And then if you're thinking about writing out of order and you, you kind of brain dump, how do you then go in and begin from creativity to writing? So yeah, that's sort of the, the divergent thinking. And then how do you get into that convergent thinking? It's, um, it's definitely a different brain space. So for me, I try to put some time between those, even if it's just a few minutes, like go get a snack and come back to really shift my mindset from one to the other. Um, for me, I am, uh, as in case it's not evident, a very type A organized person. And so I tend to, I tend to work in the physical. So a lot of times I will use post-it notes or index cards or different sheets of paper to kind of group ideas together to help figure out the structure. So that's very often what I'm doing. Once I have sort of the brain dump, I'm thinking, okay, well, what are the common themes here? How can I organize these? Which might come first or second? You know, really trying to play with all those ideas. They're, they're like building blocks, you know, and trying to figure out which ones go where. And do you find that that process keeps you focused and keeps you from going into that negative thinking of I can't do this? Yeah, definitely it helps. And I think it's, it's definitely a different way of thinking, but I, I started this with my first book is really breaking things down into smaller parts. I think a lot of creative work, we're creating something big, a, a show, an album, uh, you know, a, in a book. And it's really intimidating again, to think of that finished product and expect it to be perfect. So I find that breaking it down into smaller pieces and focusing on, I want to make progress on this chapter. I want to make progress on telling this part of the story that helps me kind of get out of that perfection mindset and really just focus on making whatever progress I can on a small, small piece of that bigger project. Amazing. Such great advice. When you are thinking about generating unlimited story ideas, that can also feel very intimidating. Yeah. Unlimited story ideas, <laughs> but it also feels very freeing in many ways. So how would you start that process with somebody who's listening to this episode? Yeah. So with, this is really what my first book was about, the, the content fuel framework. And the whole theory behind that is that we like to think of content ideas as one thing. Like I have an idea and it's this singular thing here in my hand. Um, but really most ideas are actually two things, right? There's the focus. What is it about? What are we saying? You might call it the topic, the message, the theme. And then you have the format, which is how are we bringing it to life? How are people going to experience that idea? How are they going to consume it? And so if you're trying to think of an idea as a singular object, you're really trying to tackle two problems at once. And that's yeah. why it can feel really overwhelming. And so I find that if you focus on the focus, what do I want to say? You know, what's the message, the goal, the feeling? Once you have that nailed down, it becomes a lot easier to say, now what's the best way to present this thing? Should it be a video? Should it be a show? Should it be an album um, or something else? And the more you do this work, the more likely the format is going to be what you were hoping and expecting for because you're going to mm -hmm. hone those skills. But breaking it into those two pieces just makes it a lot easier to tackle you know, idea generation when you're breaking it into steps. I love it. When you think about content creation from a marketing point of view versus content creation from a, a traditional creative yeah. poet, writer, performing artist, yeah, what's the same and what's different? Oh, that's so that's such a good question. Um, I think if you're a good creator, and in, in either sense. Uh, the passion and the drive behind it of wanting to create something good, of wanting to convey what you're hoping to convey, you know, in, impacting people's emotions or thoughts in the way you want to is very similar. Um, although, you know, the objectives may be different, uh, that drive to do that, to evoke an emotion and connect with people is the same. I think it tends to be more regimented maybe in a, in a marketing context, if only because we have 47 different stakeholders who are all expecting reports and numbers and deadlines and all that. Um, and sometimes with creative work, we're, we have a little bit more freedom to create on the timeline that might better suit us or, you know, without all that inside influence up front, which can sometimes make marketing, you know, work a challenge. That makes perfect sense to me. I would love to know, um, more about story fuel and what's going on in your company these days. 
Yeah, so Story Fuel is sort of just the name for the work that I do. Um, I have a, a few contract folks that I work with, but we're not a huge team. Um, I'm not trying to be an agency. I really want to keep that intimate feel of the direct work that I do. So I work directly with companies and individuals who are trying to build out their content strategy, trying to build out their content practice and operations uh, to advise and, and coach them through that. I do a tremendous amount of training and workshops and keynotes. That's really the bulk of the work that I do because I find for me, I really enjoy it and I'm able to reach more people that way, which, you know, feels, feels a little bit better to help more, more folks in one fell swoop. Um, but I'm also starting to do more higher level work with regards to, you know, creating that psychological safety inside of an organization, creating the atmosphere that's right for creativity and innovation, and how we can do that inside of our organizations to kind of, you know, help companies hopefully come up with better ideas to, to innovate and to solve problems more efficiently. I love that. How would you describe supporting companies to create that, that atmosphere of psychological safety for creativity? I mean, yeah. I know that, that it's done for like being able to speak your voice and all that, right. but the creativity part is amazing. A lot of the conversations in that space really come down to like a culture of, of like risk tolerance, right? How much risk do people feel they can safely take? Um, it comes down to talking about retribution and, and, you know, whatever disciplinary things you have in place. Are people afraid to get in trouble if they try something that doesn't work? Um, so kind of looking at the, the broader scope, you know, it's a little bit of HR, it's a little bit of, uh, of psychology, you know, it's sort of a sprinkling of all kinds of things, but usually starts with talking to a lot of folks inside to see if we can figure out what's holding them back individually. And then again, finding the trends between that to say, you know, several people mentioned they were afraid of not getting their bonus or afraid of, you know, uh, not, not being included on the next project. So it looks like maybe retribution uh, is something we need to think about there. That's amazing. You're making such an impact to such a wide group of people and it's the ripple effect is fantastic. I hope so. That's, I, that is really, I mean, I think I've said it a few times now, but I'm really driven by impact. That's what's most important to me. Um, it's not necessarily about like money in the bank or, you know, like I do not want to be famous. Like it is, it is really just about trying to, to reach people and, and help them feel more confident and creative and efficient. Amazing. Let's talk about Prove It. Yeah. So Prove It is my latest book, uh, came out in October of 2022 um, and it's sort of the the next evolution of the content fuel framework. So content fuel framework was all about how to come up with the ideas and prove it is really, it's the, it's the convergent thinking part of that process, right? Of saying, okay, now how do we select the ones that are going to best serve our intentions, our goals? Um, and in this case, I'm suggesting that we focus on that content that helps build trust because right now this current environment that we're in skepticism is higher than it's ever been. Consumers are doubtful. We're all skeptical of everything we see. And so trust is really at a premium. So really showing folks how to take a look at what they need to say in order to build that trust and creating content that says those things. Wow. I think you're touching on something that's so true is the skepticism and the, the, the lack of trust and the disappointment in how people have been behaving for mm -hmm. the last several years it takes so much to rebuild trust. Absolutely. It is so, so much better to keep it than to have to build it. <laughs> right. Do you think that everyone is, is, uh, everyone has, is experiencing the fallout of those who have not been trustworthy? Yeah. A hundred percent. I think, um, you know, there's all, there's all kinds of psychological um, studies and things that show we focus on the negative, right? And so even though we may have a hundred interactions that are positive, where a business delivered on their promise, we're going to remember that one that didn't, right? Where the thing showed up late or broken or didn't do what they said it would do. And so those bad actors, if you will, sort of poison the well for the rest of us. You know, it's the yeah. folks in your spam folder that are hurting the email marketers who have good intentions, right? Um, and so, yeah, it's definitely a ripple effect. And I think that's why it's kind of more important than ever to make sure that you are setting yourself apart because everyone is saying the same things. Nobody goes out to market saying our product will probably be okay at what we say it will, right? Nobody <laughs> says it's hopefully going to show up on time, right? We're all making a lot of the same promises, so the onus is on us to prove that we are the ones who fulfill those promises. 
I think I might actually look on an ad or look at somebody who says, I hope this is okay, but I can't promise. I think I would probably look twice at that <laughs> to see what it is that they're doing. Cause that's hilarious. Oh, there's, there's a, I'll have to track it down. Hopefully we can find it, but there's a, a meme that went around. It was a photo of someone's like letter board outside of a restaurant. And it said, come try, come try the wings that so-and-so on Yelp said were the worst wings they ever had. And it was the same thing, like picking one outrageous review. Uh, and it had a lot of intrigue. It brought people in. Yeah. That's so funny. <laughs> what would you say sets people apart Oh, it's in terms a, of trust? It's such a big question. I think, you know, there's the tough thing about trust is when we look at a lot of the other KPIs, the key performance indicators we focus on, they're very quantitative, very measurable. Trust is more qualitative. It's difficult to measure. Um, and we don't have sort of a unifer universal trust scale. So it makes it hard to, to talk about in that way. Um, but what we do know is that the folks who, who show instead of tell are making major headway. They're making a bigger difference. Um, this is like, you know, in society, we call it like bringing the receipts, right? Or like put your money where your mouth is. We have a lot of these kinds of phrases around it where, you know, prove it, show me, show me the money, show me the receipts, show me your math, show your work, right? Our math teachers would tell us. Um, so it's the same, same kind of philosophy is if you want to differentiate yourself, if you want to be perceived as trustworthy, then you need to take that transparent approach to really showing the, the truth behind the statements that you make, because just saying it is not going to cut it anymore. So for example, somebody saying, I support people in writing books, but they have zero clients that they can actually show that they have supported writing books. That's yeah. telling. That it, yeah, that and is not telling. showing okay. exactly. Yeah, and it's funny because in Prove It, I actually use an example of when my first book came out. I got a PR company that called me and promised that they were going to get my book in front of you know however many millions of people, um, but they couldn't share the names of any authors that they had worked with. They couldn't tell me um, what kind of tactics they were going to use to achieve these seemingly impossible numbers. They had no case studies. Their website hadn't been updated. So. They were telling me that they could do this, but all of the proof that I could see was not backing that up. So that's really where it comes into play is are we are we providing the proof to back up the things we're saying? That's amazing. And also it's on the consumer to be able to look at the content and determine if they are actually trustworthy. Yeah. I mean, and the reality is we're living in the age of more choice than ever. And so we can't expect our audience to spend a long time looking to, you know, be diligently creating spreadsheets, comparing different options. Sure, some will. You know, we know that folks for a major purchase will spend, you know, 13 minutes or more reading reviews. But at the same time, there's a lot of options out there. And so we need to make sure that the proof is it, we're putting it forth. We're sharing it. It's not something they have to go digging to find that we actually deliver on our promises. That's really, really good advice. How would you say, Melanie, consistency plays a role in this concept of trust and market and uh, content? So there's there's sort of two schools of thought, and I think they're competing even within my own head. Um, broad strokes, I think it's really important that you make providing proof a, a practice rather than a one-off tactic. It needs to be something you're thinking about all the time because it's going to bleed into your different work, your email, your customer service, your sales. It's, it's all over the place. So in that sense, we want it to be consistent, happening over time and happening throughout the organization. Um, that being said, I know that a lot of times when we talk about consistency and content, we're talking about posting every single day or, you know, every single week. Um, I do think consistency is important, but I also think, uh, that being able to choose the consistency that makes sense for you is more important than following some best practice you heard or read somewhere. Um, plenty of people will tell you, you know, you have to post every day or you have to post three times a day at 2 PM and you know, whatever they try to provide so many prescriptions. Um, and the reality is it is better for you to be consistent at the cadence that is realistic for you than to set an unrealistic goal and mismanage those expectations for yourself and your audience. Yeah, that's so true because they're going to start, uh, distrusting you if you're not consistent with when right. your podcast episode is supposed to drop. That's right. What about consistency of how you show up? Mm. Well, this, I mean, this is where trust comes into play big time, right? Um, 
I really focus on on messaging that and I, I even joke in the beginning of the book that like if your claims aren't true there's nothing I can do to help you like that's yeah. that's beyond my <laughs> my realm right um, but yeah absolutely I mean it like we said it only takes one negative interaction to really color somebody's uh, opinion of you in, in a negative way and so it's important that you're doing these things on a regular basis that you're being honest about what you can and can't provide um, Again, I don't have this, the data off the top of my head, but there are studies that show that things like a 4.8 or 4.9 rating is actually more believable than a 5.0 rating because people don't believe that everyone's perfect, right? So you need to be transparent. You need to be showing up and, and giving the full picture uh, because that's gonna what's going to allow people to trust that you know you're telling the truth. That's amazing. Well, with that said, I would love to thank that total stranger who many, many years ago gave me a 4.8 rating on my <laughs> Facebook business page. So thank you. I did not realize that was a good thing. <laughs> Helping your, right? Because I think when we see it, when we see perfect, like no one thinks perfection is possible, you know? So when we see a 5.0, your thought is, well, surely they're paying people to leave good reviews or something like that, right? But if it's 4.9, I mean, that's still amazing. And it shows me that it's, it's real reviews because they're, they're not all perfect. Yeah. Amazing. Amazing. I love this conversation. Are you ready for some fast talk, Melanie? Let's do it. All right. What's your favorite book? Uh, currently everybody writes by Anne Hanley. Nice. Who's your favorite speaker and why? Ooh, I was going to say Anne Hanley again. I don't know if that's, that's breaking that's the okay. rules, but no, yeah, we, I, I, no love rules here. Anne. I love watching Anne do her thing. Amazing. How do you memorize when you get on stage and you've been on some big stages? Uh, I like to listen to myself like on audio recording. So I'll, yeah. I have different steps that I go through, but yeah, listening back to an audio recording is a, is a really good way for me to, to memorize. Feel free to give us the steps because I know our listeners would love to hear. Yeah. So the first step, uh, obviously, as I'm creating the talk, it's that post-it note method you talked about. Then I will usually, you know, that's the focus. Then I do the formats. I create any sort of visuals that I need. I put those things together. So I'm matching the concepts and the scripts to whatever visuals. I will usually record myself giving the talk um, video so that I can see what's working, what's not. Um, and then I'll use the audio from that or, you know, a secondary or, or a third attempt at just the audio. And that will be my sort of on the go, you know, on the airplane in the taxi. I can listen back to that talk and familiarize myself. Everyone who's listening and watching, Melanie is a master speaker, so <laughs> feel free to uh, steal her, her practices. All right. What do you do the day before you speak? I don't know that I have a day before routine that is consistent. And just because sometimes I'm virtual, sometimes I'm in person, sometimes I'm flying the day before, sometimes I'm already settled in. Um, so it really depends, but definitely day of, uh, I don't eat a bunch before I go on stage. Uh, I don't drink too much coffee before I go on stage and I tend to listen to music to kind of get my, my energy up. Amazing. What podcast are you currently obsessed with? Ooh, I love 99% Invisible. Um, it's all about sort of the secret stories in our urban environment that we don't pay attention to. So like one episode might be about why street signs are green. Like you never thought of that. Um, or, you know, things like that, that you never think of. I love it. We're going to put all of these in the show notes. Is there anything that you want our listeners uh, to grab of yours? Some gifts? Yeah. So if you head over to my website, storyfuel.co, and I'm sure we'll have the link for you. Um, I have a bunch of resources on my site. Some are paid, others are free. Um, things like cheat sheets and guides, uh, guides to headline writing, guides for content ideas. So lots of helpful things there that will hopefully spark your inspiration and, and get your ideas flowing. Amazing. We'll have to have you back on to talk about AI and ChatGPT. We didn't get to it because this is so juicy without it. So I do want to hear your point of view at, at some point about that. But it's been such a pleasure to have you back on the show. Thank you so much for being here. And where can our listeners get in touch with you? If you check out storyfuel.co, that's my website, it has everything about working with me, it has my social links about speaking, anything you need is, is there at storyfuel.co. Amazing. And we'll put all this in the show notes as well. Thank you so much, everybody, for dropping in with us today at the Big Talk Podcast. And if you're watching this on YouTube, be sure to subscribe, hit that notification bell so you get access to our latest videos. I so appreciate your time. It means a lot to us that you spend it with us. Feel free to share with us on Instagram what your biggest takeaways were. And remember, your voice matters. Big love, everybody. <laughs>